You survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. <coughs> this weekend saw ugly scenes on the streets of London. This included jihadist flags being waved and people calling for God's curses to be upon the infidels and the Jews. Meanwhile, a vigil was held in Trafalgar Square yesterday and the contrast was stark. God Save the King was sung by British Jews mourning the loss of 1,300 Israelis who were murdered on the 17th of October Hamas attack, as well as the 218 hostages still stuck in the captivity of the terrorist. There simply is no moral equivalence. And in the light of all this, we'll be discussing what one of my panellists has called the deadly interaction between Islamism and the woke. The first claims the legitimacy of theocracy, and the other claims the illegitimacy of Western liberal democracy. So is there a tension in multiculturalism? Meanwhile, the Tories are in a torpor not seen since Henry VI's 18-month-long catatonic state in the 15th century. The Labour Party has secured two new MPs in two by-election wins, Mid-Bedfordshire and Tamworth. If the Conservative Party doesn't wake up, last week's by-election results will simply be an early taste of the bitter outcome of next year's general election. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by a cerebral panel this evening, the editor of Conservative Home, Paul Goodman, and GB News's senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's time for the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst.
Jacob, thanks very much indeed. Let's begin this news bulletin with some breaking news that's just come to us in the last few minutes. We're hearing from the terror group Hamas. It says it's released two hostages. We understand, according to Hamas, their families have been informed. We also gather that the two hostages may be elderly people. It's not known at this stage uh, any other further details. But we do know that local Israeli television channel 12 have repeated this report, which would seem to suggest there is something to this report from Hamas. Uh, we don't know at this stage whether those hostages are Israeli or whether they have dual nationality. But that news to us in the last 10 minutes or so, Hamas says it has released two hostages and we understand Israeli local TV is reporting that that is the case. If we get any more on that, of course, we will bring it to you right here, GP News. Now, today, the Prime Minister has confirmed that the Gaza hospital blast last week was likely caused by a missile launching towards Israel. Rishi Sunak says the hospital blast was caused by a missile or part of one that came from within Gaza. He also said the UK is providing an additional £20 million in aid to civilians in Gaza, as well as deploying RAF and Royal Naval personnel to the region. The British government judges that the explosion was likely caused by a missile or part of one that was launched from within Gaza towards Israel. The misreporting of this incident had a negative effect in the region, including on a vital US diplomatic effort and on tensions here at home. We need to learn the lessons and ensure that in future there is no rush to judgment. Meanwhile, the Met Police Commissioner has told the Home Secretary today the government may need to toughen up the law on hate crime and terrorism. It comes after Sir Mark Rowley met with Suella Braverman to discuss the force's decision not to arrest protesters calling for jihad against Israel at demonstrations over the weekend. Sir Mark said horrific and gruesome attacks by Hamas had already aggravated our own terrorist threats in the UK, with hate crime against Jewish communities up 13 fold compared to this time last year. Sir Mark said 34 arrests have been made so far and the force is trying to identify another 22 suspects from photography. We're accountable for law. We can't enforce taste or decency, but we can enforce the law. Conversation finished really around the line of the law and it's our job to enforce to that line. It's Parliament's job to draw that line and the thought that maybe events of the moment are illustrating maybe some of the lines aren't quite in the right place. Meanwhile, a London underground driver who led a free Palestine chant on his packed train has been suspended. Free Palestine! Hope you will have a blessed day today and look after yourself. <laughs> After hearing that on social media, Transport for London said the driver who led the chant on Saturday was suspended, pending their, pending their further investigation. The incident happened on Saturday as around 100,000 protesters took part in pro-Palestinian demonstrations in London. Footage posted online by journalists appeared to show the chant being led over the train's speaker system. Now, a body has been found in the search for a man who was reported as being trapped in his vehicle in floodwater in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. Meanwhile, a man who died after a tree struck his van near Forfar in Angus during Storm Barbette on Thursday has been named as John Gillen. The 56-year-old was pronounced dead at the scene following the incident. You're with GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. This is Britain's News Channel. Central to the Israel-Palestine debate is the question of moral equivalence. Time and again, we see an attempt to equate the Israeli state with Hamas, or indeed the actions of the IDF with the indiscriminate acts of Hamas terrorists. But as I've said on this program before, there is no real moral equivalence. Well, over the weekend, this moral disparity displayed itself clearly on the streets of London. A pro-Palestine march took place in which 100,000 people were on the streets in support of Palestine. Now, most of these, the vast majority of these, were peaceful and merely exercising their legitimate right to protest. However, there's equally no doubt that this movement has provided a space for extremists to thrive. A rally was held by the known Islamist group Hizbut Tahir, in which the speakers called for jihad. The only 
solution is jihad by the armies of the Muslim countries. Not by you and me, who we? What training do I have? There are people with arms in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, across the Muslim world. You might say that this is just a few fringe actors, but if you brought the picture out, you could see from the footage that there were hundreds of people present. Hezbollah here's stated aim is the re-establishment of the caliphate and the global enforcement of Sharia Islamic law. A figurehead for the group was called Hamas Terrorists Heroes. But this event posed a difficult challenge for the police. As the Metropolitan Police Statement said after the event, the word jihad has a number of meanings, but we know the public will most commonly associate it with terrorism. Specialist officers have assessed the video and have not identified any offences arising from the specific clip. We have also sought advice from the Specialist Crown Prosecution Service lawyers who have reached the same conclusion. Well, it didn't end there. An individual had this to say at the protest. <laughs> Originally, the Metropolitan Police released the following statement. The flags in this photograph are not those of ISIS. They are the Shahada, which is a declaration of faith in Islam. ISIS flags may appear similar, but are not the same. We have specialist officers with knowledge of flags working on this operation to assist with these assessments. But when the Canadian human rights activist, Jasmine Mohammed, among others, translated the Arabic of this individual as, may Allah's curse be on infidels, may Allah's curse be on the Jews, the Metropolitan Police deleted its tweet and announced the individual had been arrested under suspicion of incitement to racial hatred. Now, this is not particularly easy for the police, and as the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, said today, the line of the law must be drawn by politicians, not by the police. And this is fair enough. We're always discussing on this programme the balance between free expression and counter-extremism laws. But make no mistake about these individuals, their flags and their chants. They are Islamist extremists. Meanwhile, on Sunday, a vigil was held by the British Jewish community calling for the return of hostages. <laughs> There were no calls for jihad, no Islamist rallies, no curses upon ethnic minorities, no fighting with the police, no balaclavas, no smoke grenades, just the national anthem and a commemoration of the deceased. But in any movement, there is a duty to draw a line around the extremists who feel empowered by it, to expose them and to root them out. As the case of IDF and Hamas, there is no moral equivalence. As always, I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. I'm particularly pleased this evening to be joined by David Lord Anderson, who served as the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation between 2011 and 2017. David, thank you for coming in. Um, do you think, first of all, that the police have the powers they need to arrest extremists and differentiate between extremists and freedom of speech? They've got a pretty full arsenal of powers where terrorist speech is concerned. Uh, after the attacks on London, you might remember in 2005, the uh, bombing attacks on the tube and the bus, Parliament debated and then passed into law um, a new offence uh, of encouraging terrorism. And that includes saying anything that glorifies terrorism uh, uh, if you're trying to encourage other people to emulate it. That even before that, uh, we had an offence of inciting support for a terrorist organisation. Hamas, of course, is a terrorist organisation, not just its military wing, uh, but the whole Hamas government is a terrorist organisation. And we tightened that one up, as you might remember, in 2019, uh, so that if you express uh, um, support uh, for um, a terrorist organisation or agreement with its beliefs, then that uh, constitutes incitement, if you are reckless as to its effect on other people. Then beyond that, um, you mentioned in your clip the uh, offence of inciting uh, racial hatred, uh, calling down curses on the Jews is a clear example of that, inciting uh, hatred on grounds of religion. Um, the Jews would qualify both as a race, a race and as a relig religious group. So there's a pretty comprehensive armory of criminal offences, incidentally with very high maximum penalties. You can get 14 or 15 years uh, for inciting support um, or encouraging terrorism.
So the police coming out, the Commission of the Metropolitan Police coming out and saying the politicians need to redraw the line isn't really fair on the politicians, is it? That they've got the powers they need, but they have used their discretion to enforce lightly when people have been saying really some pretty appalling things. Well, those powers were intensely debated in Parliament. I, I remember, you know, the debates on religious hatred, where you should draw the line, the debates on glorifying terrorism, and the initial proposal was that any glorification of terrorism would be punished. And then someone pointed out that Nelson Mandela was a, was a terrorist, Robert the Bruce was a terrorist, and <laughs> terrorism goes back in time, it goes across national boundaries. So it was, it was uh, slightly reduced. But I must say, uh, I think it would, be, would have been surprising to a lot of people who were in Parliament during those debates uh, to feel that um, people could, with impunity, uh, chant for jihad in that context on the streets of London and not be punished for it. And the sympathy I suppose one has for the police is that the chants need to be translated, the flags need to be translated. They say they have specialist officers, but that clearly takes a bit of time. Whereas I think many people would like to see arrests made on the spot and people chanting abuse pulled out of crowds immediately? Yes, I mean, certainly the main obligation of the police, as it seems to me, when it comes to uh, a rally or a procession of that kind, is to protect other people. So no one should be intimidated or threatened or harassed. And the only way you can deal with that is by acting at the time. It is difficult. And I understand that the, 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 the jihad incident might have related to the question of who were they actually calling on. And if they were standing outside an embassy, as I believe they were, and summoning the Muslim armies of the Arab world to assist Hamas, then at least arguably they, they weren't uh, inciting support. Um, they, they weren't encouraging Hamas itself. They were encouraging other people. Um, but it was a pretty fine distinction. That's a pretty... Um, tidy distinction, isn't yes. it, to say that if you're inciting a legitimate authority to support an illegitimate authority, that is legitimate, but if you're just inciting the illegitimate authority directly, that's illegitimate. Well, perhaps this is what happens when you have lawyers with you, which, <laughs> of course, the police did have. I mean, they had yes. Crime Prosecution Service lawyers with them, uh, who were no doubt um, bend bending over backwards, to, to be fair. Um, but, yes, it was um, perhaps a, a surprising outcome, bearing in mind the strength of the laws that the police have at their side. And this seems to be much less of a freedom of speech issue than you might have thought, that um, it would be perfectly reasonable for somebody to chant saying uh, that um, Palestine should have its own territory or that the people of Palestine should be treated um, carefully if Israel retaliates. All of that would be perfectly legitimate. Nobody would be questioning it. But this is actually chanting that is saying the terrorist acts are, are right. And jihad, this word that can mean so many things, is clearly being used to mean a war against the infidel and the Jews. Well, I mean, I wasn't there. From your clip, it, I, I would agree. As you know, um, jihad, it's one of these words a bit like crusade for Christians. You know, you can talk about having a moral crusade. It doesn't mean you're actually wanting to slit the throats of, of Muslims. And equally, that flag, the Shahida flag, looks very like the ISIS flag, but it, uh, it contains holy texts. So I suppose the other um, thing the police had to bear in mind is that they were in the realm of, of religious expression, and for that reason, they felt they had to tread very gently and then come out and say that it's all the politicians' fault in the end, which seems a bit of a wet response. Well, I think, I've, I should tell you, I've got great respect for Mark Rowley. Mm. Um, I had a lot to do with him in the aftermath of the Manchester attack and the London attacks of 2017, when he was in charge of counter-terrorism. And when he stopped doing that job, um, when he thought he'd retired from the police, he spent two years of his own time uh, you know, looking into this and uh, looking into whether there was a gap in the law that had to be filled. But I think even if he's right uh, in, in his prescription, I don't think it would have made any difference here. I mean, what, what he is saying is that there should be laws to criminalise uh, the creation of a space where terrorism can take root. In other words, he wants to take the law a step further back from the actual commission of a violent act and try to penalise groups who don't themselves preach violence. I mean, his book Tahrir is an example of this. It's, a, it's an Islamist group. You know, you could compare it in a way to a, to a communist group, if you like. They want a, a state founded on different principles, uh, principles entirely inimical to the democratic way of life, but they don't uh, espouse violent means of, of, of getting there. And, and even if you do that, then I'm not sure you uh, solve the problem of people calling for a different kind of, of jihad. 
Um, but I think, I think also when you do that, uh, you create a few dangers um, because you start asking the police uh, to get into quite a political realm. Which we don't want to do because we want to maintain freedom of speech and therefore we're probably on about the right balance where we are if only the police acted. Well, well David, uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for coming on. Um, with me now is Yasmin Mohammed, who as well as being half Palestinian is a Canadian human rights activist who has shone a light on Islamist extremism across the West. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Yasmin. Uh, you, you've written an article recently explaining about your concerns for people living in Gaza and how they are treated by Hamas. I wondered if you could um, try and explain the difference so that people understand that the people living in Gaza are not all Hamas supporters and won't all be um, advocating terrorism. Yes, that's absolutely correct. I think, first and foremost, people get confused when they see these, um, you know, free Palestine rallies. They don't recognize that there are, that Gaza has a bit of a different um, situation than, you know, what is the Palestinian Authority, like the West Bank. So Gaza has been independent for a while, for, since like 2005, I believe. And they have had, since 2015, um, I might be getting my dates wrong, they've had the Hamas terrorists as their government. They have been their leaders. So they have been the ones that have been, <clears throat> excuse me, responsible for, you know, the unemployment, the the dirty water, the, the, the electricity that cuts out for hours at a time. Um, Gazan people have been very unhappy with their leadership, but they are a terrorist organization at the end of the day, and you can't exactly vote them out once they've been voted in. And that was a, a, a mistake that a lot of people made based on the propaganda and the lies that they were sold by Hamas. And, of course, it's, there's no doubt that there are a lot of people in Gaza that do support Hamas, um, but I think the larger majority of them are just afraid. They so, are afraid of the, the, uh, for their families and for themselves. So how much popular support do you think Hamas has in Gaza now, um, considering that it um, fails to provide uh, clean water and so on, and the, the fear that if people were free to express a view, what view do you think they would express? Well, polls that were done in July, so not too long ago, were showing something like over 60% of people in Gaza were saying that they do not want Hamas leadership anymore. They would rather be under the Palestinian Authority, just like the West Bank. Um, so they, have, they were already saying, you know, please stop chanting for the death of Israel and all Israelis. Please try and have a two-state solution, go back to the borders that were created in 1967. Again, the numbers aren't great. You know, they're like 50-50 pretty much. You know, I wish they were higher. But it is a lot more than I think what people are getting from seeing these rallies all across the Western world, you know, where in Australia they're screaming, gas the Jews, and in all over the world they're singing, they're chanting Chaybar Chaybar, which is a, a reference to a genocide of, of Jewish people by Muhammad. So people tend to think that these are Gazans, that these are people from Gaza, but they're not. These are people that are just purely anti-Semitic most of the time, or useful idiots that really don't understand what's going on and probably couldn't find, you know, Gaza on a map. So I think what's what's going on here is that the voices of the Gazan people have, first of all, been dampened by Hamas, and now they are continued to be dampened by other extremists all over the world who are just chanting a lot louder than they are. Well, thank you very much, Jasmine. You've explained something, I think, of fundamental importance that people mustn't confuse the innocent people living in Gaza with the terrorists of Hamas. Um, don't forget to let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. Coming up next, an international lawyer has gone viral for taking the BBC to task on the question of war crimes, and she'll be joining me in a moment. Plus, we'll be assessing the rather multiculturalism in these protests. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Well, 
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the smart speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg, and yes, this is still State of the Nation, and you've been getting in touch with your thoughts, for which many thanks. Uh, Robert, Jacob, we need to remember that the people at the weekend's demonstrations are supporting Palestine, most are not supporting Hamas. And Hugh, although the crisis in the Middle East is at the front of our minds at this difficult time, I hope that neither media or political tension upon Ukraine will be diluted. That's a very important point, Hugh. Um, I've said on this programme before, there is no moral equivalence between Hamas and the Israeli government. Israel is a liberal democratic state, and it therefore subscribes to the international rules-based order. And with that comes responsibility for a proportionate response. Hamas is a prescribed terrorist organisation. Israel has been accused of war crimes in both Gaza and in the West Bank. But under the UN Convention, a country has the right to defend itself from armed attack. Even when Hamas committed war crimes, such as the slaughtering of 40 babies or the gunning down of innocent unarmed civilians, Israel has responded, in my view, legitimately. Of course Israel makes mistakes, like any government does. We made mistakes in the wars waged in Iraq or Afghanistan, for example. But not to see the fundamental distinction be between accidental damage and flat-out terrorism is not to take this subject seriously. Well, my next guest was interviewed about these allegations of Israeli war crimes on the BBC uh, over the weekend. Um, every strike that uh, Israel takes, every military action is weighed up, it is analysed to make sure that according to international law, the anticipated collateral damage, the harm to civilians, is proportionate to the military aims of a strike, a strike that is militarily necess necessary uh, and legitimately targets terrorist infrastructure. So these uh, suggestions of collective punishment um are morally reprehensible liable. I'm joined now by Natasha Hasdorf, international lawyer and barrister. Natasha, thank you for coming in. One of the key things you discussed was the question of collective punishment. 
How would you define collective punishment and what is it lawful for a state to do and what is it not lawful for a state to do? Well, this is a term we've been hearing deployed frequently and it's inextricably linked with the same false allegations of war crimes which were even repeated in the chamber in Parliament this afternoon. Uh, it is that sort of misrepresentation of the facts uh, before we even get to the law, which I think is at the heart of so much of the vitriol that we have been seeing pouring out against Israel, as you have already been covering, even on the streets of the UK. Um, but the misrepresentations of international law uh, go to the issue of proportionality that uh, I addressed in that clip you've just played, uh, and the sickening uh, equivalence which is uh, suggested of comparing casualty figures on both sides. Uh, it's misrepresentations like that uh, that serve to cloud the issue um, and uh, hood hoodwink people so that they don't properly understand what is it Israel is required to do under the laws of armed conflict. And importantly, uh, they are uh, fooled into thinking that Israel is in fact breaking international law. So what is Israel allowed to do? There have been considerable concerns, for example, about water not being supplied to Gaza. Is it legitimate to cut off water uh, when you are facing a terrorist attack from a particular territory? The starting point is that Israel isn't required under international law to supply anything, uh, certainly not to Hamas, uh, who is striving even in the course of your broadcast. There have been uh, rocket, continued rocket fire onto Israeli civilians. Um, and there is no international legal requirement for Israel to provide anything to Gaza. The only provision under uh, Article 23 of the Fourth Geneva Convention is to facilitate the supply uh, of aid and supplies by third parties if they are not going to be diverted to Hamas. Now, some of your previous contributors have talked about Hamas's violent control over the Gaza Strip after they violently seized control in 2007. Um, that is uh, not a, a question as to whether or not Hamas will seize uh, the supplies that are now being let in uh, through the Rafah crossing. Uh, Israel has committed to continue that supply of humanitarian aid, even in these circumstances, even though it doesn't have uh, an obligation under international law to do so. It's going above and beyond its requirements. And this is very difficult for a democratic state because it could be, in legal terms, much more brutal than it is actually wise to be. Is that fair? Um, it's not uh, only that, and if I can supplement um, your introduction, there's also a, a positive obligation, not just on Israel, but all states' parties to the Convention on Genocide, uh, for Israel to take a very robust response here. But as in previous operations, and this has been well documented and commented, commented on by legal and military experts, uh, Israel has always strived to ensure the minimal civilian collateral damage. Uh, the warnings that it issues uh, to civilians through text messages uh, in previous operations and phone calls to individual householders, uh, the process of knock on roof, a final warning to any civilians in a building before it's struck. All of those processes that, in fact, Israel has championed, which uh, many armies don't follow, um, even Western liberal democratic human rights protecting armies. Uh, and that is the, the reality, which is so far from the, the liables that we have been hearing. And allegations of war crimes are extremely easy to make. They are... Um, extremely difficult to unpick because the factual circumstances are being so badly misrepresented. As we found when Israel was accused of bombing the hospital, which um, Rishi Sunak confirmed in the House of Commons earlier on, uh, now looks almost certain to have been a Hamas faulty rocket anyway. And sadly, that's nothing new, because, of course, you'll recall that two days before that, Israel was also accused of striking a humanitarian convoy after having encouraged civilians to leave to the south of Gaza, where it is safer. Subsequently, that's also been um, revealed to have been a, a Hamas bombing fleeing civilians. But the... Um, the, con uh, the, the, the combination of the false factual reporting and the blatant misrepresentations and abuses of international law create this sort of perfect storm. One thing I'm interested in is how you differentiate between a siege which is legitimate and collective punishment 
which isn't. Is there a clear legal definition of the two? It comes down to the intention. So the starvation of civilians, um, if a siege is implemented for that reason, it's plainly uh, illegitimate, unlawful. Um, but Israel's aims here have been clear and repeatedly stated to get rid of Hamas, uh, change the status quo in the Gaza Strip so these, this terrorist organization or any of the others that crossed the border on the 7th of October, because we must remember it was not just Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PFLP uh, and Fatah members also crossed over. So to change the reality of the situation in Gaza, which is for the benefit, as you were hearing earlier, of ordinary Palestinians living in Gaza, as well as the Israelis that are being subject to this appalling slaughter, butchery and torture. That's the key thing to remember. It is the most appalling and wicked slaughter. Thank you so much for clarifying the complex international legal issues for us. Uh, coming up next, has a woke hatred of our own nation enabled extremism? Plus, is it time the Tory party woke up? I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. The show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan Tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever, and that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Welcome back. As my next guest has pointed out, Enoch Powell was wrong. There have not been rivers of blood in Britain, especially when compared to America or France. Britain has largely been a case of success when it comes to the question of integration with many different groups and cultures living side by side in harmony. However, as we discussed earlier in the programme, there is clearly a subset within Britain that does not lend its support to groups like Hamas, uh, that does, sorry, lend its support to groups like Hamas, as well as holding values that are diametrically opposed to our own. 
problem seems to be the intersection between Islamists and the woke. Islamism is the endorsement of a Sharia-based theocratic society, and wokeness is intent on undermining liberal democracy. With me now is my distinguished panel, editor of Conservative Home, Paul Goodman, and GB News senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. Paul, you wrote this extremely interesting piece today where you were saying that woke so seems to hate our own understanding of our own culture and Western liberal values that it is destroying that which protects us from extremism. Um, what can we do about this? Well, it's very important first to be clear about the terms. And the word multiculturalism, around which this whole debate turns, does have different meanings to different people. And I've always thought that for most people, and I still think this is true, it basically means the multiracial society, which is why I've always been against conservative attacks on multiculturalism. I think most people mishear it. But a kind of deeper meaning, as you've just said, is people living in different ways. By and large, we've made a great success of it. But there is a problem. The first problem, uh, in fact, has got nothing particularly to do with this week. Um, it's the general point about importing foreign quarrels here. So we saw in Leicester last summer, for example, tensions between Hindus and Muslims. Then, as you say, there's this wider point, which I don't think holds for most people on that demonstration on Saturday, or for most Muslims, of Islamist extremism, whereby those who hold it see people as defined by religion rather than their common citizenship. I think that's increasingly a problem, and it makes me feel less optimistic than I was. And you make the very good point about multiculturalism, which is how I see it, that anybody who's come to this country, whatever their background, whatever their culture, can be British. And that's a good thing, and that seems to have worked quite well. But, Nigel, the point on foreign quarrels coming here, that's a real problem, isn't it, when you have people taking sides on behalf of Hamas, where there may be there were hundreds of people seem to be protesting for Hamas at the weekend, and there may be thousands in the country who think that Hamas is right, that's a different problem for the country to face. Yes, but I mean, th th those demonstrations were in support of Palestine. Uh, obviously, they've been in support of Hamas that they would, that people would have been arrested. Well, there were the larger numbers that I think we can accept were in support yeah. of Palestine, but there certainly seemed to... And people have never been there. They're, they're... There, there seemed to, certainly seemed to be some hundreds yeah. of people who were actively supporting Hamas. Well, I mean, th th there were some there, some there who did, and anyone who is actively supporting them obviously should face arrest. And, I mean, I like Paul's, Paul's piece. The... The only thing that made me uncomfortable about it is there seems to be an underlying assumption, which I think you were repeating, that uh, Western values, Christian values, British values, which are broadly the same, should never be questioned. And I would say that probably we should question it. We can't accept everything as being... I'm not saying they're wrong, but we can't accept everything as right um, and have done with it. That's what happened, you know, when um, we colonised various places, it was done with a justification that we, we were spreading Christianity. The modern equivalent... Very rarely, actually. Well, the very, modern very, equivalent very, very is rarely. invading countries and saying that M we are... Most we are colonial offering... governors found the missionaries an absolute nuisance and discouraged well, them. Um, the modern equivalent is that we're, offering, that, that we're offering liberal democracy to the countries that we invade. I think that these things just need questioning. But we shouldn't undermine our own liberal democracy and say that it's all very bad and has done terrible things at the same time. I think on the whole, British values, liberal democracy, these are really good things. But there's a deeper point here, which is that this particular sort of Islamist extremism mindset, it's actually a sort of challenge to universal religious values. Uh, and one of the um, good signs I cited in my piece was this letter from a senior group of imams and sheikhs... Yes. ..who very clearly denounced the massacres as being done by Hamas, so they were countering the conspiracy theories that run through uh, some sections of the British Muslim community. And they were basically calling for dialogue. And there's a lot more of this classical, uh, traditional Islam around in Britain than you would think, sometimes from reading the papers or watching TV. And this is very important, that we... Um defend the law-abiding Muslim from the accusation that everybody is on the same side and that of the 100,000 who may have marched, we recognise that 99,000 uh, were not advocating Yes, of terrorism. course. I mean, yeah. that, that, that surely is, is where you show that multiculturalism is actually working.
Indeed, though multiculturalism has become, as Paul said at the beginning, a very difficult word because it means these two very different things. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to my panel. Coming up next, as the Conservatives lose two seats in Tamworth and Mid-Bedfordshire, is the party in a torpor not seen since Henry VI's 18-month catatonic state in the 15th century? Plus, does it take one to quango? Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Last week saw two losses for the Conservatives in the Tamworth and Mid-Bedfordshire by-elections, while Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has clearly been taking lessons from the playbook of that electoral success Sir Tony Blair. Nothing much is being done to inspire Conservative voters to turn out. Instead, it's complacently assumed that they will do so when it really matters. But that time is already upon us. The Labour Party now has a tangible chance of seizing power in next year's general election as Sir Keir Starmer is busy self-identifying as a Tory and has even said that taxes are too high, while he has excised Corbyn's more extreme policies. The government needs to be shaken out of its stupor and stop attacking the voters upon whom it depends for support. If not, then last week's by-election defeats will be a haunting prelude to the results of the next general election. Well, I'm now joined by the Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent, uh, Matthew Goodwin. Um, Matthew, thank you for joining me. Does your polling and your focus groups show um, much hope for the Conservatives at the moment? Well, it's not looking great, Jacob. If you look at those two by-elections, one of the things that really stands out is that result in Tamworth, where actually the swing against the Conservative Party was bigger than the equivalent swing in 1996, a year before 
Uh, the Conservatives obviously lost quite heavily to New Labour. And if you look in general at the national polling, Labour are really where they need to be in order to win a majority at the next election. They need to be at least 12 and a half points ahead in the national polling. They're currently averaging around 15, 16 points. Now, against that, as you allude, Jacob, there is this problem for Rishi Sunak, which is that about 40 percent of Boris Johnson's voters are currently saying they're not planning to vote at the next election. If he wins those back, uh, if he can win those voters back, then the race will indeed narrow. But at the moment, they don't seem to be warming to Mr Sunak. And what about the vote for reform? Because we're back to a situation which we used to have with UKIP, when you could point to seats and say, if the people who had voted reform had voted Conservative, the Conservatives would have won. Is that something we should be concerned about as Conservatives? Well, I think absolutely. Any party to the, to the right of the Conservative Party is always going to be a problem, especially if the race uh, narrows. The interesting thing about reform Jacob, is that they're currently winning about 15% of the Conservative Party's 2019 electorate. So this reminds me of UKIP in 2011, 2012. If the 5% in the national polls begins to climb, if we start to see reform going up to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11%, then obviously that will be uh, really the nail in the coffin for the Conservatives at the next election. Um, the other big challenge here, of course, is apathy, as you alluded to in your opening comments. I think one of the big problems for the Conservatives in 1997 was, was apathy, was people just staying at home. Uh, and I think this time around, we may see that again. There's a lot of disillusionment in the focus groups that I sit in about illegal migration. Legal migration crime, by the way, Jacob, is becoming an enormous issue in Britain, the, the, the concerns over shoplifting, the, the belief that nobody is being punished. Uh, these traditional conservative issues are the ones where I think many conservative voters feel most unhappy uh, about. So those are the ones that I would be urging Rishi okay. Sunak and, to vote. And that should be pretty straightforward for the government, that if it does traditional conservative things like dealing with law and order and dealing with migration, then it would win back the voters who seem to be wandering off to reform. And that's the easiest um, group to win back, I would have thought. As long as the party is delivering, and, and, and herein lies the problem, we know that the Rwanda judgment is, is yet to be made regarding small votes. We know that legal migration is unlikely to fall dramatically before the next election. So some of these things are going to be very challenging to change. We've also got these concerns over crime, which I mentioned, burglary and shoplifting in particular, and of course, the cost of living crisis. I mean, if, if interest rates do begin to, sorry, if inflation begins to fall dramatically uh, and food prices continue to fall, that might give Rishi Sunak more of a chance. But as I say, those 2019 Conservatives, Jacob, their top issue is above the economy, is, is immigration. immigration. Immigration is the, is the number one issue for those Boris Johnson voters. OK. Well, thank you very much, Professor Goodwin. With me now is my panel, the editor of Conservative Fame, Paul Goodman, and GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. Um, Nigel, is the um, Labour Party putting the champagne on ice? Uh, I would think that the Labour Party are actually looking at the champagne, but not quite putting it uh, putting it in the bucket yet. Um, there's a long way to go. There is a year. Anything could happen. Uh, if you were putting a, a, if the Labour Party was a racehorse, it's worth putting a bet on them to win the next general election. But nothing is certain. And I think that the results that came out of uh, Midbeds and Tamworth. Especially mid beds, there was there was to be a, um, a grain of hope for the Tory party if the Lib Dems had taken the seat and shown it was a protest vote. Reform obviously caused a, a bit of a problem in marginal constituencies, but um, again, um, not a huge one. We're, we're making the assumption that uh, all those reform voters in Tamworth would have gone. Uh, would have been Conservative voters otherwise, and the, the Tory candidate would have won by 57 votes. <coughs> I don't think you can make that assumption. But David Cameron neutralised UKIP by offering a referendum. He yes. did what the UKIP voters wanted, and they did come over to the Tories, and he won in 2015 unexpectedly. <laughs> can Rishi Sunak do something similar? Well, um, I think that, that uh, Matt made the point there. Stop the boats. Stop the boats would obviously be... <clears throat> that, that's been his absolute promise. Uh, there's no sign of that happening. 
even if everything went right, even if um, Rwanda did get off the ground and the Supreme Court gave the, gave the go-ahead, it's unlikely the boats would stop uh, in any meaningful way. So that promise isn't going to work. 51 to 64, 79 to 97, 10 to 14? Well, I think um, it's worth putting the by-elections in, in perspective. Uh, for myself, I'll put my head on the block and say I think by-elections are a less reliable indicator than opinion polls when they're right. And what the polls show is that Keir Starmer's lead, it's less big than Tony Blair's was in 1996, and he's further behind. So I think some of the talk last week in left-wing circles about a Labour landslide was grossly over the top. But, at the moment, it does look as though Keir Starmer could at least force a hung parliament, if not probably win. And that's where we are now. But, you know, as Nigel said, a year is a long time. All sorts of things can happen. And since 2010, we've had the coalition, UKIP, Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, the Brexit Party, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss. Who's to say in the next year there won't be change? But it does look difficult. And Rishi Sunak has to have a, a clear plan, which at the moment he's just not convincing and, voters he's got. And Matthew Goodman is right. It's got to be delivery, hasn't it, that we've had enough of promises. Manifestos don't matter. It's in the next year. Can things actually happen that people see tangibly making their lives better or um, assuaging their concerns? <laughs> Something happening, I should refer to stopping the boats, would, would be a bit of a start. But I am mindful, if I was taking a, a gloomy view for the Tories, that in, in 1996, you know, the economy was going well. Ken Clark cut income tax by a penny, I think, in the 1995 budget. It made no difference come the day, because Conservative credibility was very low. And the, one of the big problems that Rishi Sunak's got um, and I'm just leaving aside his performance in the conference season that we can come to, is he's inherited a wasteland. Uh, Boris Johnson was a mixture of the brilliant and the bad. I don't think anyone would claim that he left with his standing very high. And the Liz Truss experiment, well, you know all about that. I do indeed. But we then get the party conference, and what are we going to get? We're going to get a change to A-levels when all my children, some of whom are quite young, have left school, and a ban on smoking... Um, if you're whatever... I mean, this isn't exciting, is no, it? No, it wasn't, and no HS2 either, uh, which was bizarre that that wasn't announced weeks before the conference took place. Um, so I think that what Rishi Sunak tried to do at conference was to uh, create, if you like, the cult of Rishi Sunak. He seemed to be moving away from the Conservative Party, that um, words like we became I... Um, it was very much... You vote for me, not the party. Party. Well, there we go. Thank you to my panel. Now, the left hand of Natural England clearly doesn't know what its right hand is doing, as it's objected to its own development plans to build a new office in one of England's most picturesque areas. The environmental group has blocked more than 145,000 houses nationally, so it's good at blocking things, but in this instance, the developer it blocked turned out to be itself. The plan was to build a one-storey building, car park and access road on the Lizard Peninsula, an area popular for its white sand beaches and abundance of flora and fauna. Natural England opposed its own proposals. It's rather like a dog biting its own tail. That's bureaucrats for you. Anyway, thank you again to my panel. That's all from me. Up next is Mark Dolan. Mark, what have you got on your bill of fare this evening? Jacob, two million people who are receiving... Benefit claims, but are not looking for a job. Britain has become a something-for-nothing country. Plus, Britain's police are a waste of time. A busy show. We're live at nine. Uh, well, I think that two million story is really important. We seem to be allowing benefits to have got out of control at the moment, and we need to get them back under control because government expenditure is too high, and we won't get tax cuts otherwise. But that's coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob rees This has been State of the Nation and Somerset. Oh, it'll be glorious. It's half term. Everyone will be having a lovely time, and we're making cider on Saturday. Hello, very good evening. I'm Alex Burkill. Here's your latest GB News weather update. It's already started to turn a bit wet and windy across some parts, but the wind and rain will become more widespread as we go overnight into Tuesday. There's a system pushing its way northwards up from France, but also a separate front that's currently making its way northeastwards across southwestern parts of the UK. This will bring some heavy rain as we go through the end of the day across southwest Wales in particular, and then spread into more central parts through the early hours. Also, some persistent rain starting 
starting off in the southeast, pushing into more eastern, northeastern England through the early hours of Tuesday too. A fairly mild night for many, though it could be a little chilly across the northwest of Scotland, perhaps a touch of frost here. For many, Tuesday is going to be a much wetter picture than on Monday. Heavy persistent rain across northern eastern parts of England could see some high totals, could be some disruption here, chance of some flooding too. Elsewhere, some bright sunny spells, but also a scattering of showers, and these showers could turn heavy, perhaps even thundery towards the south. Temperatures near normal for the time of year. We're looking at highs around 14 or 15 Celsius in the south, cooler further north. Into Wednesday, we will see a spell of wet weather across the southeast to start and also some rain pushing into eastern parts of Scotland, perhaps northeast England. That could turn a little bit heavy at times and coming so close to the heavy rain we saw last week, it could make ongoing issues worse. And otherwise, as we go through the rest of the week, we're staying with the unsettled picture with further wind and rain, but temperatures near normal. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time! Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top...